Let's say amen for the praise team. Listen, I'm going to get ready to uh, move to the side. Got a great man of God here, Dave. He set up some books outside, also uh, some tapes and stuff. And Dave has been around Milwaukee for years. I, I, got a, I had a chance to, uh, to talk to him about a month ago. I'm getting feedback from one of y'all mics. So could you check the mics from one of their mics? Amen. I got a chance to sit down one day. We went out to eat. We talked. Uh, finally got to meet him. Heard a lot about him from uh, uh, Merlin. From Merlin. And I got to talk to him myself. Listen to it. He, he gave me a, a case of CDs and DVDs. I was able to watch a lot. I was able to watch. I watched about three of those. Listen to the CD. And seen him in action. How many of y'all came expecting something from God? And, you know, um, so after they get finished singing, the next voice we will be hearing is that of Dave. Amen. Amen. I, I, the thing is, I see him doing multiple different things. He go throughout the state and other countries, ministering, and just seeing him in action just from the uh, CDs. Charles North from way back. Charles, when I told Charles about you, Pastor Charles Emery, I said, oh, I know Dave. I followed Dave many years ago. That's two and a half decades ago. Amen. Charles remembered you. And so by me talking to him, that validated your experience, your, your faithfulness towards God and your purpose in life towards God and the healing of God's people. I appreciate you coming out and sharing a word with us. Whatever you do, just let God have his way. Amen. That's all I'd ask. Amen. That's all we ask for, right? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I know that he's going to give us what we need on today. Amen. Anybody need something? I just heard a few of y'all. Anybody need something on the day? Dave, I came home hungry today. You ready to feed us today? Hallelujah. So, after the choir has sang, y'all go right on here. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to give Dave this mic right here. It's already been wiped down, ready for you to just go right on in. Let God have his way. Amen. Amen. God be praised. Hallelujah. How many grateful, just grateful for his love. Grateful for all that he has done for you. Hallelujah. Let's bless his name for about five seconds, Lord. We thank you, God, for all you've done, Lord. We thank you, God, for every wave you made, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. Your love for me. Your love for me. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. Your sacrifice. Your sacrifice for me. For every blessing. For every blessing. Give unto me. Give unto me. For every valley. For every valley. You used, you used to strength. I don't. I don't deserve. For every 
you keep me going. Yeah. And I'll stand amazed at your power. God, you amaze me. You amaze me. You blow my mind. Hey, I'll stand amazed at your strength. Oh, you're so that strength that kept me going those times I was ready to give up and I stand amazed at your power there's no one above him there's no greater name and I stand amazed at your glory y'all ever really experienced God before the presence of the Lord and I stand amazed at your strength yeah yeah Oh yeah, 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 and I stand amazed at your power. Oh, oh. so oh, 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 amazing, amazing, so. One more time, everybody say, so amazing. He did it for you. Amazing. He did it for me. So he can do it again. He can do it again. Amazing. A healer. Amazing. A deliverer. So A miracle worker. A miracle worker. Amazing. A deliverer. Amazing. Let's bless him. Let's bless him. God, you're so amazing. There's nobody like you anywhere, Lord. God, and we thank you for being who you are. God, we magnify you. God, you're big in our eyes. Hallelujah. God, we lift you. We lift you, Jesus. We lift you, Jesus. There's nobody like you. Lord, we bless you, Jesus. Come on, let's pump it up a little bit more. He needs a little bit more from you today. I know I'm not the only one he has blessed. I know I'm not the only one he has given another chance to. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift him. He deserves the glory. He deserves the praise. Hallelujah. Come on, bless his name in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. 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 Woo, Dougie. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is, 
It is so good to be with you today. Hallelujah. I cut my spiritual teeth going back 40 years ago on inner city churches. I've been in many of them in Milwaukee, but as God opened the door, we've been inner city, Chicago, Detroit, Atlanta, Philadelphia, L.A., San Francisco. And uh, I have the badge of honor of having my vehicle broken into in every borough of New York City. <laughs> From Harlem to Brooklyn to Queens to, the, to uh, Manhattan and uh, whichever one else I'm fixing, I'm forgetting, but uh, I, I love black churches. I, I just love black churches. I, I, I thought for a while God mixed up on my color because from all the inner cities, God promoted me to Africa. And we've been in, I think, nine or ten countries, but I've been to Africa like 30 times. But I tell you, there's no, no, there's no other group in the world that has the ability to worship like you do. I mean, I, I, I just love it. I, I think I was in the bathroom when in heaven they were handing out gifts. And I, I missed on the gift of rhythm. <laughs> And my wife laughs at, at my videos from Africa or other sit churches because you're going left, I'm going right, I'm going up, you're going down. But uh, honestly, I just love your worship. You, you, you have a special place in heaven, I promise you. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're current, currently in our seventh week of revival in uh, Two Rivers, Wisconsin, just about an hour, just over an hour and a half north of here. But I have believed, as I've come to Milwaukee almost every month, for the, well, have come every month for the last 12 years, but for the first few years, going back to 1985, the only place God would allow me to go is Wisconsin. I would literally come here for two weeks, go home for two weeks, make some more money, so I could come back and do it again for two weeks. But I just know all of that seeds sown that Milwaukee is destined for a revival. And Wisconsin, hallelujah. And we're seeing such incredible miracles in Two Rivers. We've actually lost count. There's been so many profound miracles. And I believe before we stop today, we'll demonstrate one or two here. How's that? I, I'm just confident for that. Hallelujah. And does anybody ever watch Sid Roth? Do you know who that is, Sid Roth? Okay, well, he's, he interviews people on the supernatural, and I, I've been on his program a couple of different times. I've, I've been his uh, guest speaker in Israel, and I'm also a professor of the supernatural on his network on, on the gifts of the Spirit. But the two times that I was interviewed by him, this series... Uh, how to be supernaturally were featured. And then another time, uh, spiritual preparation for end times. And uh, if you watch those series uh, years ago, th this set, three of them together, sold for $150. And I got a bunch left over. <laughs> so I'm selling them just to, get, to clear out the closet. But you can get all three for $59. If you, I got some out there today. And uh, then one of my... One of my favorite series I'm going to touch on today is the five keys to the supernatural. And uh, anyway, there's actually 100 total key points. And in this series right here, what it amounts to is 100 seven to eight minute teachings on the 100 keys. So, but if you want just the, the audio version of the 100 key points and a booklet to go with it, it's $12. And uh, I promise you, it'll bless you. You go through that every day for 30 days, I guarantee your life will be different. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me as we just pray, honor God with a short opening prayer? I know you're all pumped up already, but just to honor God here. Father, we honor you. We honor your word today. And I thank you, 
And Father God, that you will, one, demonstrate your word with signs before the day is over. But Father, I pray that as I do what you want me to do today in teaching on the five keys to the supernatural, the Father, they'll, they'll reach into our heart and bear forth a harvest of your word, 30, 60, and 100 fold. I thank you, Father God, as you demonstrate your love and your greatness with signs, wonders, and miracles, that Father will be careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Back in 1979, when I gave my heart to the Lord, shortly thereafter, actually 78, December 78, um, then in, this, in January 79, God spoke to me very clearly, and he gave me one specific scripture, John 14, verse 12. There it says, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth in me will do what I do, and even greater. Praise God. So uh, God gave me that as an assignment, as, a, as a, my, my life verse. And he said, you need to understand how Jesus did what he did. And a few years ago, he dropped in kind of a, just a neat little nugget into my heart. He said, well, if you want to do what Jesus did, then do what Jesus did. <laughs> Ponder that, you'll get it later. But Jesus had a life of supernatural demonstration. Amen. 35 miracles are attributed to him, but it says in the book of John that if all the miracles were recorded, the, all the books could not record. There was just so many miracles that he did. But my, my, my job was really to understand how did he do it? What is it that he did that allowed him to, to do all those incredible signs, wonders, and miracles and, and after 20 years, 20 years of studying, which brought us to 1998, in New York, Utica, New York, I was m doing a, a service on Mother's Day, and God dropped into my heart a summation of 20 years of study, 20 years of visions. Guys, I've had so many incredible visions, dreams, but most importantly, a serious study of the Greek and the Hebrew and, and looking at the, the, the origins of Scripture and trying to figure out it's just how did Jesus do what Jesus did. But again, on nine, Mother's Day 1998, he dropped into my heart a, a summation, which was five keys to the supernatural. I hadn't planned it. It just came out of my spirit spontaneously. And uh, I'd like to bring that message to you again today. Can you say amen? Key number one is sensitivity. Can you say sensitivity? Sensitivity. sensitivity. Amen. Sensitivity is hearing God's voice. Sensitivity is, is knowing God's word because he speaks to us two ways, by his word and by his spirit. Can you say amen? And those two will always agree. If you ever get a word that you say is from God, you know, you, you have an inspiration or you have a prophetic word or whatever, it will always agree with the word of God. If it doesn't agree with the word of God, then it might have been too much pizza the night, night before. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he always will speak by his spirit or by the word, and those two will always be in agreement. But we need to be sensitive. We, we, we need to be in tune to what he might be saying. And uh, what I've learned through many visions and dreams and much study again is the way we become more sensitive is prayer, fasting, and self-denial. Those are not encouraging words to your flesh, I promise you. But by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, we, we increase in our sensitivity. Many years ago here in Wisconsin, it was about, about 1993, 94, I was in La Crosse, Wisconsin, before a church service, and God gave me just a, uh, 
incredible vision. And, and this is one of the visions that actually led me to understanding the key of sensitivity. But I was, I, w I was actually in a prayer meeting with a couple other people, and God just opened the, the spiritual realm to me, and I, I saw a man going through a barrier. Actually, this was actually featured in one of the episodes on Sid Roth. They, they did a reenactment of it. But I, I saw the man going right through a barrier. And the, the barrier wasn't the big barrier. It was like a, a wall or, or like a big billboard, actually. And, and the man, which I was the man, but it wasn't about me. It was about all of us, mankind. But I literally walked right through the wall. But what I discovered when I walked through the wall, it was, it was by, by appearance, a wall, just like this wall. But when I walked through it, it was paper thin. It was like a paper banner. And you know, sometimes I don't watch TV anymore, but I stopped watching TV probably about 30 years, 40 years ago. But they used to have, when they introduced a new car, in, in the summer season, sometimes they would actually drive the car through a paper banner. And then, you know, there's your new car for the new season. But when, when, when this happened, I, I saw the, go, myself go right through this banner, right through this paper wall, and God said to me, you're on the edge, you're on the, you're, you're on the verge of spiritual breakthrough. Hallelujah. You're coming into a season. More signs, more wonders, and more miracles than you could ever possibly imagine. Hallelujah. That'll preach. <laughs> but he said to me, he said, as much as I want to use you, again, this is 1993 or 94, as much as I want to use you, I can't. Oh. I said, well, why, God? He said, because your flesh is not ready. We have to crucify our flesh. We have to deny our flesh. Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew 16, where, where he says, I'm going to build a church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And, and, and then Peter actually, what Jesus said, then I'm going to lay my life down and pick it up again. And then Peter, pretty strong words, Peter rebuked the Lord. He said, Lord, that will not be unto thee. But what did Jesus do? He turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. That word offense is the Greek word scandalon. It's where we get the English word scandal. And it literally means a trap. It literally, if you look into the Greek root word, it means trap stick. It's where, where if you're going to set up, do you ever use mouse traps? I know you do because I did it all the time in Wisconsin. We lived out in the country and had mice invasion every fall. And my job, because I was traveling in the ministry, th that I had to get rid of the mouse. And I only had two or three days when I was home to do it. But what did I do? I, I, I baited uh, a, a trap that made the trap look appealing. So I, 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 I deceived those little mice with the intent premeditated murder. Amen. You've done the same probably. Amen. But what do you do? You put the trap where the, the, the critter is going to be. But you bait the trap with something that might be appealing. Peanut butter, cheese. But what happens? The moment the, the mouse takes the, the bait, he loses his life. And see, that's what the devil comes to do. To steal, to kill, and destroy. And, and he baits traps for us. He baits us with a, a, somebody to say something to us that would be an offense to us. 
but we have to refuse the bait because if we take the bait, we're going to spring the trap. Amen? But this message isn't about that. That's just part of the verse. He said, you're an offense to me, thou savorest. That is really a funny word, savorous. In, in newer versions, it says, you're setting your mind. But in the Greek, phreneo, it means the, heart, the, the seat of emotion. From the seat of emotion. And, and literally, it's from the gut. And science tells us now, literally, we have as many neurons in the gut as we have in the brain, and the gut is attached to the vagus nerve that is attached just to the right part of our, our, our brain where emotions are felt. So what the devil does, he baits you with fear, usually a fear of loss. If you stand up for God, you're going to have a... You, you know, you're going to lose friends. If you stand up for what's right, you're not going to be accepted. Are you hearing me? Okay, that's phreneo. And that's what happened when Jesus said that I'm going to lay my life down and I'm going to pick it up again. Well, Peter didn't understand the picking up again, but he didn't want to lose Jesus. So fear of loss. Thou art an offense to me. But then the real part of this whole message is, or this verse for our interest today, Jesus says, if you are going to be my disciple, hello, you must take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Amen. Now, that word cross is the Greek word staros. Most Greek words have English equivalents, many English equipments equivalents. One word will have three or four different English words it's translated into. But that word, staros, is always translated cross. A place where one dies. And Jesus says we must take up the cross. Now what happens is most people take up a cross that fits their work schedule. Hello. A cross that fits your Playtime, a cross that fits your comfort zone. Hello. But see, I, I've learned a long time ago, we don't pick our cross. Before the foundation of the world, God had a plan for us. Now, we can't remember our past, but we have one. Because it said, he knew us, in Ephesians 1, 4, he knew us before the foundation of the world. And he called us to be holy and blameless. Holy. It's not a popular word in a lot of churches today, but we are called to be holy. But see, he has a plan for you, and the, his plan, it says there in Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. And King James says, which is your reasonable service. Now, it don't sound very reasonable to me, but uh, the Greek word there is logikos. And that word, better translated than more modern translations like NIV or New American Standard, it translates your spiritual service of worship. The worship that God is looking for is not what we have here today as good as it was. The worship that God is seeking is the living sacrifice. And then it says, be not. Now, this is an, in Greek emphatic imperative. That means it's not a suggestion. It's a command with official authority. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's the Greek word metamorpho. That's where we get met, that's where we get the word metamorphosis. It's a picture of a caterpillar spinning a cocoon and, and building a cocoon, a coffin to die, and then new life comes. And that's the picture transformed. It's the same word we see in Matthew 17, right after Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, 
I command you, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And then it says six days later, he was taken to a high mountain apart. This is Matthew 17, verse 1. And the start of the verse says, and. This is right after, again, he, he made this announcement. And he was transfigured. Transfigured. His raiment became as white as light. He radiated the light and glory of God. That Greek word for transfigured is the, the same word, metamorpho, and where it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Be transfigured. Woo! Shine with the glory of God. How do we do that? By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Hallelujah. That's what God wants. That's what God is looking for in this day and hour is a church on fire, a church that's radiating the glory of God. And how do we do that? By denying ourselves, taking up the cross. Now, personally, I'm not ashamed to admit this, but I don't like my cross. I don't like going to most of the countries I've gone to in Africa Rwanda, Burundi, Zaire, Congo, have all been war zones. We were the first ministry ever. United Nations gave permission to do crusades right on UN territory in the midst of the Rwanda genocide. People were dying in the camps where we were. One per minute from machete wounds, from, from dysentery, malaria, and cholera. When I was asked to go there, I said, I don't think so. <laughs> Time Magazine, on the front, front cover of Time Magazine, April 94, it says there's no devils left in hell. They're all in Rwanda. And people were dying one per minute. So I was asked to go, and I said, I'll pray about it. But in my mind, I'm saying no. My, I mean, I don't have much common sense. I don't have a fear, but I don't have much common sense. But I got enough sense to say no when I should. But God said go. And I tell you about God's supernatural grace. We went there and we did four incredible camps bringing together the Hutus and the Tutsis. We, we, it was so successful. It was just absolutely amazing. And the fifth camp that we went to, the militia met us. They said, you're not welcome here. And what we said, well, we have a letter from the president of the country. We got a letter from the head of the United Nations Refugee Relief Commission that we should be here. And they said, no, no you're not welcome here. And they said, you better leave or you're going to get killed. Well, we didn't leave. And this, the team, we had 100 different, 120 different Africans and we had my, my team of five stoned, but not one person got hit. Not one vehicle got damaged. Nine vehicles. God's grace. The next day, a team from Red Cross of over 100 people all went in and all were killed. So you, we, we have a grace from God. We have a supernatural protection. And when you're walking according to his plan, you're walking according to his purpose, you're going to be walking in the supernatural. And no weapon formed against you can prosper. See, key number one, sensitivity. What is God saying? It's interesting that the first miracle that Jesus did, and it's always important when you study a topic, uh, in, in the Bible, it's called the law of first mention. So if you want to study tithing, look at the first mention of tithing. And it was with, with Abraham and Melchizedek before the law. If you want to study the Sabbath, what's the first mention of the Sabbath? In creation, the seventh day, God rested. If you want to study miracles, particularly miracles of Jesus, what's the first miracle Jesus did? 
turning water to wine. And what's interesting, Jesus did not even do that miracle. Mary came and said, <clears throat> they, they, they don't have any wine. Do something. He said, it's not my time. Mary said, whatever he says, do it. Whatever he says, see, that's sensitivity. What, what does he say in his word? What is he saying to you in your heart? What is he saying? Whatever he says, the second key is obedience. Key number one, sensitivity. Key number two is obedience. And we can see that exemplified in the first miracle. Mary said to the servants, whatever he says, do it. Well, the servants did it, and it, the miracle happened, the best wine. Hallelujah. But I've added kind of a, a God gave, that was, all God said was obedience. The five keys of the supernatural. But I have since added an adjective to it. Radical. Radical obedience. Can you say it? Radical? <laughs> Amen. Radical obedience. I, I, I had a, a man come to me. I was up in Brown, not in Brownsville, uh, Toronto. And a man came to me with a dream and said, Dave, this, is for, this dream is for you. And in the dream, God said, climb up high onto a diving platform and then go out onto the edge of the, that diving platform and jump. Well, that's not a problem, except that when you get to the edge of the diving platform, there's no water. And God said, jump. Now, that, 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 that requires radical obedience. <laughs> Amen. Now, you have to know, if God said that, you got to make sure you weren't hearing some other voice. But God said, when in the dream I questioned him, I said, but God, there's no water. He said, by the time you get there, there will be. Ooh, doggy. <laughs> That's supernatural. I had, I had a test of that kind of radical obedience here in Wisconsin back in, in the late 90s. There was a church up in uh, River Falls, that's just near Minneapolis on, on, on Wisconsin side. And uh, the, the pastor is Dan Dennison. And I had waited like 10 years to finally earn enough merit to, to, to be invited to this church. It was like 500 people. And anyway, I'm, I'm there for a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday service for miracle services. And God showed up so strong Friday and Saturday with signs, wonders, and miracles that on Sunday they had more people than they had room. They were taking down the partitions that were kind of a, you know, marking the back of the church, but taking it down, setting up chairs. So it was an overflowing crowd Sunday morning. I'm on the platform with the other pastors, Pastor children's pastor, a youth pastor, the pastor pastor, and they're singing this wonderful, beautiful song, I Live to Worship You. You know that song? It is a beautiful song. I live to worship you. Just like the Romans 12, 1, be a living sacrifice. That's the, that is the spiritual service of worship. So we're singing the song, I, love, I live to worship you. And God speaks to me. And he said, that's not true of this congregation. He said, husbands are not loving their wives. Wives are not submitting to their children, uh, to their husbands. Children are not obeying their parents. He says, this church is in rebellion. He said, stop the service and tell them they need to repent because we're Rebellion is as witchcraft, and I'm not happy. <laughs> I said, God, if I do that, my ministry will be all over. 
I waited 10 years to get to this church. Now you want me to absolutely destroy my reputation. One of the biggest churches in Wisconsin in the 90s, and I'm going to stop the service and tell them they're into witchcraft. I had a choice to obey God. And, and this is what's so important in obedience, that we obey God. But this was really a hard thing for me to do, honestly. But I did it. Now, normal protocol on something like that, I would probably get the pastor's commission, permission. But I knew if I said something to him, he would say, no way, Jose. And I had to obey God. I just knew I had to obey God. So I didn't even acknowledge the pastor. I just walked up from the back of the, of the, of the platform, tapped the praise and worship leader on the arm, and I said, I need the microphone, stopped the song, and I said what God said to me. What happened next? Only God could have done. Because you could have heard a pin drop on the carpet. But I said, you have to repent. Because God's not happy with this. What happened was almost the entire church, young people, middle-aged people, old people, they all came forward and repented. Whew. It was such an incredible move of the Holy Spirit. But that's obedience. We have to obey. And I, I, I started this down one path here. I said to you that I don't like my cross because I go to all these kind of bad zones in Africa and in India and in Russia. But what I've recognized as much as I don't like my cross, there's nothing I'd rather do. I wouldn't trade it for anything because I'm in the center of God's will. Amen. And that's what you want. But about two weeks, three weeks maybe, after God gave me that vision of going through the barrier, I'm ministering up in North Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota, and I'm sharing with the congregation this vision. It was such an incredible vision. And that we're coming into this incredible move of God beyond anything we could ever ask, think, or imagine, or beyond anything I could imagine. And I got a big imagination. But I'm sh I shared that with the, with the church. I said the spiritual barrier is about to be broken. And the moment I said that, in front of the whole congregation of people, God said to me, that's not what I said. <laughs> you know, God can say more in a second than we could probably say in a day. But he corrected me. He said, that's not what I said. He said, he said, I, I mean, he said that he said, <laughs> you're, on the, you're on the threshold of spiritual breakthrough. But he said, the barrier is not spiritual. He said, the barrier is intellectual. He said, the problem is, me, mankind, think too much in the natural, not enough in the supernatural. The barrier, the spiritual barrier, folks, is already broken. The veil is already rent. We have free access to the kingdom of God. We have the free access to the heaven. And, and there's nothing in between us and God anymore. The barrier is our stinking thinking. We limit God. We limit God. Now let me show you how, how we might limit God as it relates to signs, wonders, and miracles. Let's pretend we have two people here. One has a headache, probably too many grandkids in one day. 
And they got this throbbing headache. This is one person to pray for. And then we have the other person to pray for that came from the hospital. This person's on their deathbed. I mean, any moment, they got tubes and stuff hanging out of them and on a stretcher, and they can barely breathe. Now, I'm going to have you come up here and pray for these two people. Now, this is a trick question. But which of these two people would be easier for you to heal? Neither. Because you or me have no healing ability. We can give them medication. We can give them doctors. We can give them surgeons. But in ourselves, we have no healing ability. But in Christ, when we are baptized with the Holy Ghost and gifts and callings are imparted to us, workings of miracles, gifts of healings, gift of faith, Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues and prophecy. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not we that are going to pray for them. I mean, we are going to be used, but we're not going to heal them. God is. God is going to heal them. We are simply the vessel that God is going to work through. Now, I'll give you some great insight. When Jesus walked the earth, all the signs, all the wonders, all the miracles that he did, I'll say that differently, he did not do any sign, any wonder, any miracle. That sounds wrong, doesn't it? Jesus didn't heal anybody. He didn't really do one miracle. I know it sounds wrong, but follow me. Because this is critical for you to fulfill God's word that you're going to do what he did and even greater. Are you with me? Isaiah 9, 6, the scripture we use at Christmas time. Now, I hope you're okay with me just quoting verses to save time. But Isaiah 9, 6. You probably know it. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulder and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Now, a child is born. Who is the child that was born? Jesus. Who was the son that was given? Christ, Jesus Christ, humanity, deity. Christ is not Jesus' last name. But in Scripture, sometimes you'll see a Jesus, sometimes you'll see Christ. Sometimes you'll see Jesus Christ, other times you'll see Christ Jesus. Now, wherever you see the name Jesus it's always about humanity. It's always about the person of Jesus. Now, wherever you see the word Christ, it's the, the word Christ is the Greek word Christus, and it means, it means the anointing, it means the anointed one, and it means Christ. So, Philippians it says, I can do all things through Christ. It doesn't say I can do all things through Jesus. See, I can do all things through the anointing. I can do all things through the anointed one. In Acts 10, 38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, double reference to humanity, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. 
So see, Jesus was anointed. And when did that anointing happen? Well, according to Luke 3, when he went down to the river to be baptized, and when he was going under the water, the heavens opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form as a dove, right? Now, the Holy Spirit is not a dove. The Holy Spirit is not the third bird of a trinity. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit is a person. And the Holy, Holy Spirit as a person in great glory coming from the throne room of God, with great glory, the Holy Spirit filled Jesus. The person of the Holy Spirit filled Jesus. Now, let me just read one scripture to you because it's really important that you see this in this experience in Luke 4. Actually, in Luke 3 is where we are reading from. In Luke 3 is where Jesus is baptized in water. And I'll just read it real quickly. Verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Now, from this verse all the way through the end of the chapter, Luke documents the genealogy of Jesus all the way back to Adam. It didn't, Luke didn't, this didn't happen when it happened. Luke, the historian, added this to add depth to the understanding that Jesus' genealogy goes all the way back through Joseph to Adam. But now what happens here is we get, we get to the end of the genealogy. Verse 38, it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Amen? The whole genealogy from Jesus all the way back to Adam. But then the next verse, it says, and, say and. See, if you can imagine this, Jesus is still dripping wet. He just came out of the water. Now, we have all the genealogy added there, which Luke put in, but the and means he, he's still wet. He just got baptized. And it says, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. What just happened is Jesus was baptized in the water and baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then when he comes out there, he's led by the, by the Spirit into the wilderness, he comes into his own hometown in Nazareth, and there he's going to read a scripture that was, that was presented to him. And, and this was a scripture that was ordained thousands of years ago. The Hebrew system, the Jewish system, they had all these verses marked out for every day of the week or every Sabbath. So this was the appointed verse for this Sabbath day, which means God planned this before the beginning of time that this was the day Jesus was going to be baptized in the water and, and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then after 40 days, he's going to come into Nazareth. And what does it say in verse 18? Well, we'll go back to verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and was custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. They handed him the place to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which 
when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Woo, doggy. <laughs> we have to see, we have to see this. We have to see this because this is so important to you fulfilling the, the mission to do what he did. You know, again, it says, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me. It does not say he that's a pastor. It does not say he that's an evangelist or a teacher. It does not say the apostles. No, it says he who believes. Are you believers today? Amen. That means you are called to miracles. You're called to a miracle ministry. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Hallelujah. <laughs> when I was in Africa, and so many times in Africa, the Africans would say, too much anointing. I always say, you cannot get too much. But I'm believing lately I'm getting too much. <laughs> but see, Jesus was anointed. What Jesus did by the plan of God was set aside his deity so he could un demonstrate anointed humanity. Now, if he did one miracle, just one, even a little one, if he did one miracle because he was God, then you and I could never do what he did because we're not God. Hello? So Jesus set aside his deity so he could demonstrate anointed humanity. That's why it says in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. Well, let me show you the real censure here on Acts 2, Acts 2, 22. The day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes in, baptizes all of them with the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit. They all come out of the upper room speaking in tongues. And then Peter starts to preach. And he says, this is what was prophesied by the, by the prophet Joel. And then in verse 22, now follow me. 22, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Notice, Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Say amen. It doesn't say a deity. It doesn't say a God. A man, Jesus of Nazareth, a man. Now, also notice, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs. So Jesus did all these miracles, but not in himself. Notice, which God did by him. God did the miracles. God did the miracles. God did the miracles by Jesus. The word by is the Greek word dia. It means the channel of an act. It means through. Jesus was approved of God by signs, wonders, and miracles. But God did them through Jesus. And God is going to do them through you. Hallelujah. Now, there's two reasons why we can do what Jesus did. You just got number one. Because the same Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that has anointed us. God doesn't change. We have the same Holy Spirit 
when you got filled with the Holy Ghost, when you got baptized with the Holy Ghost, just like Jesus, the Holy Spirit came upon you and filled you, qualified you to be an ambassador for God and then for God to work via you. But the second reason or means of which you can do what he did, Jesus was without sin. He was the perfect man. Amen? Now, through his blood, through his sacrifice, three curses came upon man at man's fall. The curse of poverty, the curse of sickness, disease, and death, or sickness, disease, and the curse of death. When man got kicked out of the garden, angels were sent there to guard the garden, and God said, the curse of poverty, you're going to sweat. The brow is going to sweat because you're going to have to work with the soil. The curse of poverty. The curse of sickness and disease is exemplified by women were going to have pain in childbirth. And then the curse of the spiritual death. It says there in Genesis, it says, Do not partake of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because the day you eat it, you will surely die. Now, it doesn't say surely dying in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it says, in, You partake of the tree, you're going to die, die. So, you know, surely, if you're going to die, die, you're surely dead. But in the, in the Hebrew, what it means, in dying, you will die. That's spiritual death. Because man was still living, but he was dead spiritually. Threefold curse, poverty, sickness, and death. Now, to break a curse, it has to be perfect blood, innocent blood. And when Jesus went to the cross, before he went to the cross, or in the process, they put a crown of thorns on his head. The very thing that exemplified the curse of poverty was the sweat of the brow. And when the, when the crown of thorns placed on his head punctured his head, punctured his forehead, the blood broke the curse of poverty. <laughs> Hallelujah. But then Jesus went to the whipping post. And by his stripes, we are healed. Hallelujah. The curse of sickness, the curse of disease, the curse of infirmity is broken. We have reason to believe to walk in divine health. But then he went to the cross. And through the nail piercing of his hands and his legs and the shedding of blood with the spear and the death on the cross, spiritual death was broken. And we have life with God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, when you put your faith in the blood, when you put your faith in the blood, particularly in the, in the, in the crucifixion, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgotten. They're removed as far away as the east is from the west, never to be found. You know, east and west is better than north and south. If your sins were removed as far away as the north or from the south, we could find them. Because if we started traveling right now north, you know, about 8,000 miles is the North Pole. Once you hit north, what your what's your next step? South. See, north and south are measurable. And because they're measurable, you can find the end point. But east and west, if we started traveling east, We'd go all the way to the, to the Atlantic Ocean. 
We'd go all the way across the sea to probably a northern part of Africa. We'd keep going north, and then we'd hit India, then we would hit China, and we'd keep going, and then we'd hit in the United States, and then we'd come all the way here, and we never would find West. <laughs> Your sins are forgiven and forgotten. They're nowhere to be found. So when you accept the blood of Jesus as your Savior, you are sinless. That means you're on the same plane as Jesus. You're a perfect human without sin. Sinless. Yeah, well, we're going to miss it. Yeah. But first, not, first John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So these five keys to the supernatural. Number one, sensitivity. Number two, well, actually, I want to, do, do they play mean if I, I'm done? Uh, what time is it? Watch, light up. Okay, real quickly. I heard this incredible story. You guys can play as I'm, as I'm speaking. That's not a problem. That, that's really cool, really. I like that. Anyway, this man was sitting on the beach in California. And God said, look at your hand. What do you see? And he saw a grain of sand. And God said, I made that. And then the man said, well, yeah, God, I know you did. It made everything. And then he said, look down the beach. What do you see? There was Bird Big Point, a mountain. And God said, I made that. And God, the guy said, yeah, I know. He made everything, God. And he said, tell me, which do you think was more difficult, the mountain or the grain of sand? And the man said, well, that's easy, God. The mountain had to be much more difficult than the grain of sand. And God said, no, they were both easy. See, what God told me about this spiritual breakthrough is we limit God with our stinking thinking. We don't think big enough. We think the mountain was greater, more difficult. So we have these two people. We have a, a person that's got a headache, and then we got a person that, that has just a, a, a death sentence. So when we come up to pray for them, we have to know we have no, no healing ability. But with God, they're both easy. But the problem is our stinking thinking. Somehow or another, we, we've got the idea that this is more difficult. The mount is more difficult. But with God, it's all easy. Nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing is impossible. So we need to get that mindset. Key number three is humility. God gives more grace to the humble. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God's ability to do what you cannot do. Humility, the more you walk in humility, you recognize, I can't heal anybody, but God can heal everybody. So you just, you, we get out of the equation, and we just let God be God. Key number four is knowledge. My people perish for lack of it. Now, knowledge is knowing God. Knowledge is knowing his word. Knowledge is knowing his ways. And key number five is compassion. And God gave me such an incredible, incredible demonstration of this. And I know we're almost out of time, but I'll, I'll close with this illustration illustration it's a real story it's my testimony what happened is Christmas Eve 1983 the coldest day in history on record now, I, we're living in Tulsa and every Christmas we, we had just moved there in 82 a year before 
But our plan was coming home for Christmas. And we did that for many, many years. But this was our second year. And the weather report, don't drive. It was like 20 below in Tulsa. That's unheard of. But we had to drive through Illinois to Wisconsin. In Illinois, the wind chill was 70 to 80 below zero. Coldest state in history. But I'm in a faith Bible school. I'm learning faith. And I said, honey, not a problem. We can do this. We'll just keep the gas tank full. Now let it get below a quarter of a tank, or three quarters of a tank. Just keep filling it up so there's no condensation. And we'll just believe God. Well, it worked fine to the middle of Illinois. And the car started sputtering. Now, there is not one single car on the road. Not one. The only cars you're going to see on the road are those that can't run anymore because the gas line froze. And now our gas line is, fr is froze. And the car stops. But being a man of faith, I went out, popped the hood. I spoke to the engine and I said, I command you to run. I command you to melt. I got in the car, started right up. <laughs> yeah and no. It only ran for 20 seconds. Because the engine was hot enough to melt a little gas that it ran for 20 seconds. I'll never forget the look on my wife's face. She's six months pregnant. And she knows we're in a bad place. Because gas lines just don't warm up by themselves. It's frozen. And she has this horrible look of fear. We're going to die. I'll never see my baby. I did the same thing. And you, you just can't imagine how, how cold 70 below is. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm shivering before I got out of the car. And now that it's been stopped for a few minutes, it's cold in the car. I had a mustache back then, and just within seconds, my mustache was frozen. Much like me. Just shivering. I opened the... Again, the same thing up in the hood. And I'm going to speak to the engine again. And recognize something. I wasn't operating in faith. I was operating in foolishness. I didn't have a word from God. I was operating with foolishness and presumption. And, and I, I just believe God would honor my foolishness because it wasn't a smart thing to do. We were warned, do not drive. Cars can't run. I repented. But the basis of my repentance was my wife. The look on her face, the fear. I said, God, I love my wife. Forgive me. Forgive me, God. I blew it. Compassion. Compassion defined in the dictionary is the awareness of the suffering of another 
and a willingness to do something about it. That compassion motivated me to repent. That compassion motivated me to deal with God. Have God deal with me? I spoke to the engine again. I got in the car. And we're here today because it ran all the way. It started right up. An absolute miracle. Keys to the supernatural. Number one, sensitivity. Number two, obedience. Three, humility. Four, knowledge. Five, is actually motivation. But the motivation of heaven is compassion. So, Father, thank you for your word today. Father, I pray. I pray that we'll get the, we'll get the picture. I pray, Father God, that you will work in us to learn these five keys and apply them to our lives and recognize that, Father, we are called. Every one of us as believers, we're called to miracle ministry. We're called to open up our hearts and let God work through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Let me, let me demonstrate a miracle. I know we're almost out of time. I need someone that has serious pain right now. Someone that has serious pain. Anyone? We have two? Okay. Do you want to sit down or do you want to fall down? You don't care? Okay. I don't don't matter to me. Okay. Can we, can we lower it a little bit, guys? Okay. Well, then we'll have somebody stand behind you. Where was the pain? In your knee? You're sure? Is it there right now? It's already gone. I, I can feel it leaving. Where was your pain? In your knee? Say goodbye, pain. There it is. Thank you, Lord. Father, I just release your miracle healing power right now, right there. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. One more, okay. Come on. It's just that, that brother. Is it him? You can stand right there. Where, where was the pain, brother? Where was the pain? Where was the pain? Okay, okay. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, I release your miracle healing power. down to the feet. Miracle working power. In Jesus name. Be healed now. Be healed now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless God. Amen. Yeah. 
I want right where you're standing I just lay your hands on yourself where it hurts at right now where it hurts at Father, right now, yes, Lord. in the mighty name of Jesus, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want you to touch every believer right now, yes, God. Right now from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Heal their bodies right now, spiritually, mentally, and physically, right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you for the many blessings that are falling on them afresh right now. Miracle signs. Somebody say miracles, miracles. Signs, signs, and wonders. Let's say it again. Miracles, miracles. signs, and wonders. One more time. Miracles, miracles. Signs, signs, and wonders. wonders. Coming to me right now. Right now. So God, as, as you make us whole today, you prepare us for the week of head. But God, even though we're getting ready to leave this place, but never from your presence. Somebody say, Lord, walk with me. Talk with me. Guide me. Somebody say, Lord, give me strength. So, Father, as you're strengthening them now, the enemy is plotting. I come against it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Death, you have lost your power. Satan, your weapons has been dismantled. That contract that you had on that loved one is canceled right now. That drug addiction is broken. That sickness, hallelujah, has been removed right now. I declare right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you are healed. But I, 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 I want to share something with you. I'm going to end that prayer in just a second. That every time Jesus will heal someone, he will say, it's according to your faith. Or he'll say, thou faith has made thee whole. I want to say this for you. Thou faith has made thee whole. If you believe that today, your faith has made you whole. I need to you to give God a praise in this place. Your faith. Your faith. Your faith. Your faith. Has made you whole. Listen here, listen here. God does not make pieces. God 
God make whole things. Your faith has made you whole. If you receive that, lift your hand all over this room. Lift your hands. Lift, lift your hands and receive. He mentioned five powerful topics. Five powerful topics. I want to show you something right here. I want to show you something. He mentioned five powerful topics. The number five is grace. I don't think some of y'all caught that. They brought, brought grace to the house of God. Anybody? Y'all see, somebody needed grace. So he had five key words to live by. To top it off, grace. So Lord, somebody, somebody need to shout, I'm healed. Come on, give me a hand. Somebody need to shout, I'm healed. Come on, you need to say it with authority, I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm healed. Amen. Amen. Before I end this, Dave, would you stand up? I want to just pray that God will give you the strength back to you. Because I, I want to share something with you all that every time Jesus preached and prayed, he will go into the mountains to pray for himself. So I want you to point your hand towards today. Father, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that you will give him back a double portion of an anointing that he has poured out in this room. We thank you, God, for allowing him to come to expose us to another level of God. I don't think some of y'all to expose us to another level of God. I'm asking that God, that now God, that you will pour back into him. Somebody say pour. Lord, because I recognize that you are not through with him. His missionary journeys are still at the beginning. Even though he's been ministering for decades and been to places I'm yet to see, he has just touched a small piece of where you are taking him to. So I thank you for the Holy Ghost. I thank you for grace and mercy that's following him into danger seen and unseen. God, keep on covering. Give him traveling mercy as he traveled the highways and the skyways. Continue to give him what to say and how to say when, he, you, when you have called him to speak to your people. In Jesus' name. Now, God, as we get ready to leave from this place, but never from your presence, may you rest, rule, and abide with each of us until we meet again. Let the church say, Amen. Somebody help them up, please.